just that. That we haven't come here to do something, just that. But we've come to where our treasure is, to delight in God and His great mercy and love towards sinners. And that's what we do when we unite our hearts in the service of God. We express our desire for Him, His glory, His fellowship, and for Christ, our treasure. So the effect of being chosen, elected, should excite love for God. You know, people say that these doctrines about predestination and election, you can't really say anything about them, and I understand what they mean by that, because you can't plumb the depths of the mind of God from eternity. But what I would say is this, that that theology ought to turn into doxology, into praise, into thanksgiving. It ought to excite love for God, that he chose me. Shows you. Now what's all this privilege for? Let's come to point two. We are a commissioned people. He says in verse 9 that you may proclaim the glories, literally the virtues, of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Now, that you may proclaim. Is there, is there greater delight than in telling, than in telling, telling others about God. The story of the, the Gadarene demoniac, that man who was full up with demons and, and, uh, and roamed in the, among the tombs, um, damaging his own body. Nobody could restrain him, absolutely torn apart. When Christ made him whole, and he sat there in his right mind. What possessed his soul? It was what a great thing Christ has done for him. So what do we read about that man? He went away to proclaim. It's actually the word preach in the Greek. He went away to preach in the ten cities how much Jesus had done for his soul. There's no greater joy than in telling. And that's what the church exists to do. And that's why we need to proclaim the gospel. Firstly, we need to proclaim the gospel in the church. To tell it to one another and to do it often. Because that's in what we rejoice. That tells us what a great thing Christ has done for our soul. And then to tell it outside to others. That they may come into the same joy. I, I think that that, that gathering demoniac, um, you know, after he, he'd gone out and, and uh, told others what a wonderful thing Christ had done for him, he spent the rest of his life trying to understand what that great something was. And that's why you have to preach the gospel in the church too, so that we can grow in the knowledge and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever tire of hearing the gospel. But what it says is that the, the church then is a confessing community. As a church, we've got something to say. Have you got something to say as an individual? I hope you have this morning. I hope that you could tell others what a great thing Christ has done for you. But the church exists for that purpose. That's what we're doing this morning. And that's what we do when we go out from here as representatives of this church, as representatives of the people of God, to take that message with us in our lives and in our words. So, what we exist to do and to be is a kingdom of priests who proclaim. And so that God will have the glory. See, the priests existed in order to serve God, to glorify God. And so do we. Psalm 115 verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And, and we ought to sing that together with all our heart and soul. I actually think it would be better if we sat closer together and then we could make a better job of the singing. What do you think? 
I'll leave that with you. Are you weak and heavy laden with the problems and the burdens and the trials of life? Yes, you probably are, some more than others. That's the fact. And we all come to church with some baggage or other. But God has done great things for us, of which we ought to be glad. So let's hear it. Has he done great things for you, of which you are glad? Is that a yes? Can any blood-bought child of the Lord Jesus Christ withhold from proclaiming the glories of this God, who called us out of darkness? And that brings me to my last point just now. We are a called people. The end of verse 9 through verse 10. A called people. This is the story of from nothing to something. From nothing to something. A called people. Yes, he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And those of us who spend a bit of time in the world know something about how dark that darkness is. And from time to time, it, it, it comes to the forefront in our own self-consciousness as Christians. When we're thinking on the Word of God, when we're listening to the Word of God, when we're meditating and reflecting upon our lives, we know about the darkness. But we've been translated from that. We've, we've been called from that. Uh, to something infinitely wonderful. We've been called to serve the Lord. And it, that can happen, of course, only if we've obeyed the call to come from the darkness into the light. There's that side of it as well. Well, the Lord calls you. You're here this morning. He's calling you if you haven't made that journey. If you haven't crossed that threshold, then He's calling you this morning. To leave behind the darkness of your life, the darkness of this world, and to step into the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what I just want to say this morning before I finish is this, that he has called us from being no people to being his people. And that's what he says, once you were no people, but now you are God's people. And in a way that sums up how I think about my, my own experience. I began by asking if you felt special. And so I reiterate that now. Do you feel at all special? As if you're someone. You know what I mean now. As if you're someone in God's eyes. Isn't it great to feel wanted? Isn't it greater to feel wanted by the Lord? To be special in his sight. And we might be nobodies in the eyes of the world. You know, lots of us struggle with this whole thing about self-esteem. I think it's overdone, but you know, and, and, and we realize that when we add everything up, we don't amount to very much, particularly in terms of this world's achievements. Even in our own estimation, we think maybe well, I, I, I'm just making a, a thoroughly bad job of it. But you know what's said about Christ in this letter? If you look back at, at, at verse 7 of chapter 2, what, what's said about him? That he was rejected. The stone which the builders rejected. Why they thought he's not quality. He's not right for this. He doesn't, he doesn't pass the test. He doesn't reach the standard. But what we are also told, that that one that was rejected was chosen and precious. And now what Peter is saying to us, that in Christ, we are chosen and precious. How wonderful. Chosen and precious. You are somebody's in the family of God, among the people of God. How come? Oh, because you've been ransomed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as he puts it 
Here you were called to obtain mercy. Called to obtain mercy. And again he's echoing scripture. Do you know the story of Hosea? He's, he's actually um, uh, reflecting Hosea chapter 2 verse 23. But, but Hosea uh, was commanded by God to marry a harlot, a prostitute. And, and th th they had sons. She was unfaithful to him. But they had sons. And in a symbolic way, he was told to name the sons um, no mercy and no people. Those were the names. And of course, really, it was a story about Israel and its relationship to God. Israel had played the harlot. Israel had gone away after false gods. Israel had been unfaithful. And so, um, he was told to say that about Israel. That you are no more my people. And you know, you no know more know the mercy of God. See? And there was a time when that was true. Of many of us who didn't grow up in a Christian family, who never knew that family relationship, who never knew the mercy of God, and then suddenly someone somewhere spoke to us. Someone proclaimed to us the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Oh, isn't that a precious moment when you first hear the gospel with hearing ears, and a believing heart to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's when you become a person. <laughs> and that's when you know mercy. And so he says that. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. And that's true for Gentiles first coming to Christ. And that's true for Christians who have fallen away, who are backslidden and are coming back to Christ. That you have known the mercy of God. And through his mercy, you can come into his presence. We all, Paul says, we all have access to God through one spirit. And that to me is, is a most wonderful, wonderful thing. But we may sink very low in our lives and we might feel that we cannot climb back out of that horrible pit of the miry clay we might feel that way but if we are a child of God his ear is open to the prayers that his people makes so let's spend quality time with the people of God as the people of God for the glory of God. We are a kingdom of priests. We are God's own people. I'm saying big, big things here this morning. So big that I don't even react as I ought when I say them. But oh, may the Holy Spirit open our minds to understand how great a thing this is. And our status exists not in terms of isolated individuals, of course, you have to be born again.